Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome everybody to our weekly episodes of Nomberg Law Live. We've been doing this for the last several years now. Gosh, over 200 and some odd episodes. And it just, I love doing it every week at 10 o'clock Central. We have some awesome guests every week. And as I like to say, it is interesting conversations with people in their areas of expertise. And if there's any person I know who has some expertise, it's my guest today, Mr. Greg Brewer from up in the Huntsville area. Good morning, Greg. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Bernard. I'm, I'm happy to be here, sir. Well, I've been looking forward to our conversation for quite a while. I've known Greg a little bit for many, many years, and we're going to get into that later on. But where you may know of Greg or where Greg really has made his mark in our state, it's with the officials. It's with the Alabama High School Athletic Association. And if you've got officials that you want to praise, you call Greg. If you've got officials you have problems with, don't call Greg, call somebody else. But Greg has been the man who has put together the current program policies, procedures, and training of officials throughout our state for the Athletic Association. And frankly, they do such a wonderful job. You never see that they're there until you have a problem with them. That's kind of the way that it goes. But I have suspect over the last many years, those issues, those problems have been less and less due to this man's good work. So Greg, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the accolades, but let me say right off the bat, it's a team effort, Bernard. One person can't do it all by him or herself. And, and I was blessed uh, with my whole life being affiliated in this working uh, capacity. I'm retired now, but when I was working with AHA because it was something that kept me around sports, I never was a real good athlete myself, but I was able to be involved. And I, I made so many friends statewide, officials, coaches, administrators, um, that all of us together made the program function, made it happen, made it go. And, I mean, that entails things from um, – an event that happens on a Friday after a Friday night football game. Uh, if, if you have something that's not didn't happen so good, uh, on the phone for two hours talking to the proper people to to find out what happened, why it happened, uh, how it was corrected or stopped or whatever. Uh, from the standpoint, until you get to the point where you have um, the recruiting and training officials. Uh, trying to bring young folks on board. We welcome old folks too, but most of the time it's the young folks that get involved because old folks, most of the time they've been around 20 years officiating and, and uh, they, they get ready to retire. So it's an ongoing process. And, um, you know, Mark Jones took my place. Ken Washington has now taken Mark's place. And uh, I wish them the best. I saw them yesterday at the Mr. Savarese's retirement party. And so um, everything just continues to move on, whether it's me or someone else, Bernard. Well, I, I appreciate those, those kind words, and, and I know of your humble nature, Greg, but this is about you today, and I want to focus and feature <laughs> a little bit about what you helped to create, some of which was, was yourself, some of which was on a, certainly with a team of, of lots of professionals, mentors, friends, colleagues, et cetera. But let's go back to Florence High School. I mean, Florence, Alabama, Bradshaw High School in the early 70s. Greg, what's, talk about your, your love of sports. How did you get involved with it? Were there any influences? I don't know from a family standpoint, or did you just pick it up and just it just became part of your life ever since you were a kid? Uh, basically that, but that was, that was because my dad was a high school coach uh, at the at the old coffee high school up in Florence before coffee and Bradshaw uh, merged uh, into Florence High School that it is today. But uh, my dad also, after he uh, coached at coffee for many years in football and baseball, he was the first principal at Bradshaw High School when it opened back in the late 60s. So um, I've been around athletics all my life. Uh, some of the local people there, a gentleman by the name of Jim Spain, who was the Parker Recreation Director, 
is actually one of the people who got me uh, it started in officiating because um, I used to officiate youth leagues there in the Florence area. That's how I got started. Uh, once my playing ability, uh, once <laughs> when I when I left age twelve, my playing ability uh, was not corresponding to everybody else. So that's when I got into umpiring, um, and so uh, went there. Then I umpired. While I was at the University of North Alabama, uh, I stayed in Florence until 23, till age 23, um, and umpired in the community. And I actually umpired some of UNA's games. I'm not supposed to tell people that, but back back in those days, there was no Gulf South Conference official staff, so they would tell the university, no matter which one it was. Back then, it was Troy, Jackson, all those. Yeah. They would yeah. tell them. You get your own officials, and the only rule we have is they can't be from the – your association can't be from the county in which you reside. So, of course, UNA is in Florence and Lauderdale County. Well, all we had to do was go two miles across the river to Colbert County. And so we formed <laughs> we formed an association there with uh-huh. people like Mickey Haddock and Joe Fowler. And, and uh, so anyway, just that, that's how my career got started in Florence and – and uh, I moved on from there. And so, yes, yeah, so I've been around athletics all my life uh, through my my day. Of course, my brother pitched at Alabama. He pitched at Bradshaw, went on pitched at Alabama. So we've all been in and around it for, for years. Well, I, I would suspect that to be a, a, an official for a, a long period of time and to have some success uh, in that profession, you not only have to have a love of sport, in general, but Greg, I would also think you'd have to have a certain temperament, a certain personality, and not everybody can can be a, a fair arbiter based on that alone. And an yeah, yeah, you're 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 hitting. I mean, you're hitting one of the fine points of of um, selecting the folks that you attempt to recruit and officiating because. You got to have a thick skin. I think that's what you're referring to. You got to have a very thick skin, I and am. you got to understand that that when when people in the stands, I mean, everybody's biased. One side is biased for one team, the other side's biased for the other. And so, you know, in a, an old adage in fishing is, if you make both sides unhappy, you're doing a great job. But the thing is that those people in the stands, they see somebody out there. Uh, we we'll use the sport of baseball. Uh, we, you see somebody out there in in a navy blue uniform with the umpire gear on. They don't see you as a human being. They see you as an umpire. And what's interesting about that is, and, and happened to me as well as other officials numerous times, that you spot somebody in the stands and you know who it is that's hollering at you. You know, part of that thick skin is you just got that mental mindset is that that today you, the umpire, know what's going on. Mm-hmm. They don't necessarily know what's going on, so just ignore them. And then you see them at Walmart the next day uh, out of uniform, unless they just really know who you were, they know you by name, yeah. they won't recognize you and never say a word to you. So it's just the uniform they're hollering at more than it is the person, if that makes sense to you. It, it, it is, and emotions can run high, and you got to know the situation and assess it so quickly. Greg, I, I, as you know, I played Little League sports all the way up through college, and as I was a teenager, one of the ways I made money was, was being an umpire for Little League games. You know, so when you. I'm 14, 15, 16, 17 years of age, I love being out at the park. It was in my neighborhood. Well, I still have an event that haunts me to this day that I want to share with you. I got to get it off my chest. And I was calling, I think it was a nine and 10 year old game. And it was not coach pitch. The kids were pitching at this point, but I'm behind the plate. And I had been umpiring, I guess, for about three years. I was still playing high school sports at the time. And we had an event. And the guy who I'm talking about knows this very well. He's an attorney in Dothan. And we, we joke about it whenever we see each other. But he was catching that day. He was having a rough day. He had missed a bunch of balls. Anyway, he got <laughs> mad at a particular call I had made. And he slung his equipment back toward the dugout as he's walking back there. 
and I should have given him a warning and come over and talk to him, but I was 16, whatever I was, I tossed him out of the game. And as soon as I did that, I just, I felt terrible, just terrible. Yes. But it was a 16 year old with a nine and 10 year old. We didn't have the, the overseer of umpires was not right there to, to maybe guide or change what I did. But uh, looking back, I should have had a little more patience, maybe a little more counseling for him. But I just, I ran him out and I've just regretted it ever since. Well, Bernard, let me, let me ease your mind for just a moment. I mean, please understand uh, and particularly when we're talking about high school and college athletics, because those are what, what it's commonly known as education-based athletics. Mm -hmm. It's not like some of the leagues that are not affiliated with education-based athletics that are there for other reasons. I'm not going to get into all that, but I could spend an hour talking about the pros and cons to that. But mm -hmm. But those that are education based, that what you did to that young man that day um, was basically give him some discipline that he needed. Um, umpires, uh, officials in basketball, just football, whatever it's volleyball, whatever sport it is, the uh, officials are considered an extension of the teaching community in the schools that compete against each other. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that that's, that goes into training of officials is that you've got to learn and what you're referring to is game management skills. That's what you're referring to. You know, could you have handled that better? I don't know. I wasn't there, but ultimately the kid violated, uh, I'm assuming he threw his bat or something. And, and, um, you know, you had to, to handle that. Now, you know, you were a young whippersnapper at age 16 and sometimes uh, young folks at that age, um, just human nature is a little bit arrogant themselves. Okay. Not, not picking on you, but it applies to everybody. You go into something and you, at that age, you know, and on up to senior high school, you, you kind of think, you know, a lot and you, you learn later that you didn't know that much. And so, uh, officiating is the same way you start out and, and this happens no matter what age you start at. You've got to learn that you don't know everything. I mean, there's a lot of people who get into officiating that think they know the rules because they watch sports on Saturday. And they get in there and they, they start thinking, okay, well, this is what they do on Saturday. And when in reality, each level is different because the rules are different. And the rules are different because the athleticism of the athletes are different. Mm -hmm. And you cannot, one, one fallacy that I've always hated about officiating is that in some ways, some officials try to move up the ranks too fast. And they try to bring the collegiate level down to high school and high school down to junior high instead of officiating in the moment. They officiate in a, in a way to try to impress those that's going to uh, maybe help them get up into the bigger levels at a later time in their career. When when they don't have to, you just do the job you need to do at the level you're at. The people that are going to be responsible for advancing you, they'll find you. I mean, it, it's it's not hard. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, the, it's those who are do the steady, uh, even-keeled job, I would say. Uh, to me yes, are, are the, the best ones. They don't draw attention to themselves and so forth. I must have learned something, Greg, because several years later when I was in law school in Montgomery, I was also doing some little league officiating. And one of the local news reporters, on-air television news reporters, kid was playing in my game. And the only reason why I knew that is because I could hear the father, the, the news reporter, chirping in my ear at me the whole game behind the plate. So fourth or fifth inning, I just walked over to the fence and I didn't yell into the stands. I motioned for him to come to me and I said, one more word out of you toward me and you're, you're gone. And he walked back up there and after the game, I didn't run him. <laughs> he was quiet after the game. He appreciated, he thanked me for that. So I must've learned something in those years, but, uh, those were the two standout times that I can, can recall. But I want to talk about 
Uh, Greg, one thing that I think is just so neat is when you have multi-generation family members officiating together, either on the same cruise or in the same jurisdiction. And what I'm getting at is in my hometown, my area of Wiregrass, we've got Wayne Pierce and his son, Gant Pierce. Gant played high school football at Northview. Wayne has been an official for many, many years. Now Gant I know, is- I know, a, both, I know both of them. And I'm just getting ready to say, and now Gant has gotten into officiating the last several years. And I know they get to call together, or at least they did. And I just think that is such a cool thing that father and son on the same crew. And I know you know those men. So I was hoping you could comment a little bit about that in general or about those two men, about how that works. Any, anytime, anytime that you can, can involve your family in your avocation of officiating, and that's what it is. It's an avocation. It's not you don't make enough money for it to be a real job unless you're in the major leagues and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But anytime you can involve your family, and a lot of officials will tell you that the families sacrifice when they're, and I'm going to have to use the word spouse because we've got a lot of ladies that, that, that uh, officiate as well. So whatever, you know, gender you are, your your spouse uh, and has to kind of take up the slack in the home when you're gone all the time. And so if you can have that opportunity to involve your family more in your officiating uh, avocation, then obviously that is a pleasure for both of you. Yes, Bernard, there's a lot of memories that can be um, obtained that way. Hopefully they're all positive. Uh, I've never seen one where a father and son disagreed on a call, but that would be interesting to see that, that sometime sure. if that happened. I would like to see <laughs> one out on that one. But, I think the, the uh, mother wife in the stands would have to come down and, and oh, overstay yeah. that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, she's the one sitting in the stands taking all the heat from all the hollering and and, and, and afraid to tell them that, that you know, I, 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 I've, I, I've had people say this, the officials tell me this story that, that you know, you have – fan A and fan B hollering uh, at the umpires because their teams are not, you know, being successful. They're playing on the umpire. And then you got the uh, family member of the umpire sitting up there and they ask, who are you pulling for? And they tell them I'm pulling for the umpire. <laughs> and all that just that shuts them up right there because they, they get embarrassed because of their conduct. But, oh, absolutely. but back, absolutely. To, back to Wayne again. Wayne, I don't know Gant that well, but um, – I've known Wayne for a long time. He's a super person, a super individual from the Dothan area, and he's been a leader down there for, I know, at least 20 years. I mean, I've been involved in this at the HSA level for 30. I was involved 33 years, and I know Wayne has been there at least 20 of those. So so you you mentioned a couple of good ones. Well, thank you for, for commenting on them. I'll be sure to share your kind words. Please. Guys, we're talking with Greg Brewer. Greg has been involved with the Alabama High School Athletic Association officials for many, many years and just sharing some, some great information. Uh, Greg, I want to ask you, you had mentioned about women being officials. We've seen in the professional ranks at all the major professional uh, sports leagues where women are not only officials now, but they're getting more and more important roles within the coaching of teams as well. Where are we in the state of Alabama with women officiating the different sports? Uh, Bernard, we were blessed um, to have the opportunity. We were one of the first states, and this was several years ago. In fact, uh, a young lady you know of, I'm sure of Dan Dothan, named Rhonda Kirk, I do. Uh, it was real big in the softball down there, but she also officiated football. And so Rhonda is, is uh, just by chance, uh, she's getting um, inducted into our Sports Hall of Fame this year in August and as an, as an official. And anyway, Rhonda is one of two females, Joy Martin is the other one out of Opelika, that have worked a high school football state championship in the state of Alabama. We were one of the, if not the first, one of the first states in the country to have uh, ladies in those roles. And that's, you know, coming from the South where football is king, that's saying something. And 
those two did what it took. They went to training camps. They they hung in there with the guys and, and just basically stood their ground and let them know, hey, we're just as good as you are. Our minds can think just like yours. In fact, our bodies can move faster than some of yours. And so, um, so yeah, uh, Alabama has been fortunate enough that we've been um, a leader in a lot of areas. Basketball, we've got a lot of female officials in basketball. Um, I don't know. We've had one or two in baseball. Uh, Nancy Price from up in the uh, Decatur, uh, Huntsville area was, was one over the years in baseball, softball. I mean, uh, of course, volleyball is primarily women, female, even though there's a lot of men that are finding out that volleyball is a pretty fun sport to call. And so they're doing uh, football uh, three days a week and doing volleyball two more of the, the other two. So, so it's kind of the gender kind of goes back and forth, but uh, to, to directly just a, a quick spot answer, I've gone around the world on this, but we are very fortunate. We're very inclusive in both gender and racial situations in the state of Alabama. We always have been. We're proud of that. And um, I'm, I'm a certain that the, the staff uh, to be will continue to look to improve and, and continue to get those participation participants up because, you know, hey, the ladies, you know, there's some out there with personalities that can handle you and I together, Bernard. So, um, once again, it goes back to game management. They can do a good job, too. Well, Greg, I know that in years past, I don't know about current, in years past, there's been an official's uh, shortage. It's just not that many of the younger generations are wanting to get into doing that, whether it's for, for hobby or for profession. If I want to get involved, if I'm an eight-year-old, a 20-year-old, a 40-year-old, how would a person get involved and begin the training process to hopefully one day become a certified high school athletic, I mean, high school uh, official? Yes, sir. Well, just like you've already indicated what you did and what I did, uh, most officials start in the youth leagues in their community. And those youth leagues are hurting for umpires. And, and uh, I keep referring to umpires because we got off on baseball in the conversation, but it applies to football referees, basketball, it applies to everything. Everybody's hurting for them. And, and yes, it, it, it is a, a major problem across the country. It's not just in Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the, the one of the biggest concerns are that we feel that that's causing this to happen is what we've been talking about already conduct and the fact that the people in the stands uh, and, and sometimes coaches, they just don't understand that, that these folks don't like to be hollered at. I mean, even with the thick skin, I mean, you go out there want to try to have a, try to enjoy your experience as an official but you're not allowed to because of the conduct directed at you or the conduct directed at each other, the coaches to coaches or the fans to the, the coaches because the kid don't play. I mean, all the, everything centered around conduct. Um, in my opinion, now, everybody doesn't have the same opinion, but 9% of the country does that that's the major issue. And these young folks, you know, I mean, from a financial standpoint, they make pretty good money nowadays, Bernard. I mean, much better than going to a, a department store uh, in town with a uh, name WM, but instead of going there and get $10 an hour, you can go out there at a, in, a, in a ball game and, and probably make anywhere from 50 or $60 an hour just by the contest. Now, of course, as you get on up in levels, you have to spend more time studying the rules and learning the mechanics and procedures. So more time's involved, but still it's pretty good pay. So, so, you know, the HSA has tried, we, we stiffened penalties against athletes for ejections. We've, we've, um, we stiffened penalties against the schools for, for conduct related, uh, bad conduct related issues. Uh, we've tried to reward them as well. The HSA has a program to reward the schools who do not have any ejections uh, during the year. Um, but without just dwelling on that the remaining time, that, that is the issue. And the young, uh, well, all right, let me say this right quick. 
there was a day in time when I first started in Montgomery 30 something years ago, where there was a lot of doctors and lawyers, people who, uh, who um, did professions that normally, you know, don't succumb, don't, don't have to to tolerate that kind of conduct. And nowadays, the doctors and lawyers know reflection on you. I just, but I, but but I'm very serious. The people in the professional professions like that, they don't care to go out and be subjected to that criticism. They just, don't, it's not worth their time. They don't need the money. They don't, they don't want to do it uh, for any other reason but to give back to the sport and to have a little enjoyment working with kids. And when you take those two things away from them then uh, they just don't care to do it. And the young folks, well, you got to get the video games away from them first. That's true. Greg, we got a couple more minutes, but I got some, some key questions I want to want to ask you. At the beginning of, we'll call it, we'll start, we'll, we'll just limit this to football, high school football. Okay. At some point on a Friday night when you have a game and it's scheduled for 7 p.m., the officials take jurisdiction of the game or the stadium. Could you explain what that means? Well, they, they take jurisdiction upon their arrival in the facility because there there are they they um, are responsible for their certain pregame duties that they have to do, but they also are there to monitor uh, conduct between the teams. And since you mentioned football, um, I don't know, maybe eight years ago, maybe 10, I lose track of time. Uh, if you'll notice in the pregame, uh, they're in the high schools now, and, and the college has gone to this. You'll see the officials line up on each 40-yard line, or no, 45-yard lines. I'm sorry. There's a 10-yard 10, a 10 belt there um, prior to the game where the teams cannot cross those lines. If they do, then they're going to be penalized for it, and that's because of some of the fights that have broken out over the years between the teams before the game even starts. So, so they do have duties when they get there and, and they have to, you know, go over, uh, ask the coaches if they're le- if the players are legally equipped. And of course, if the coach says no, then they've got just a very few minutes to get them equipped because they can't start. They can't play. They can't play in the game if they're illegally equipped or, or if they do, then they're penalized afterwards. So, um, they go around and inspect the field. They check the timing devices. They check the, the chains on the side, you know, you'd be amazed, you'd be surprised how how many chains have little links that are missing out of them to gain an inch here or there for the, for the whole team, only the whole sure, team knows. Sure. So wow. the officials have to go and check that too. So so I'm not sure where you want me to go with that, but that's why they get there early, and that's, mm-hmm. that's why they take over jurisdiction the moment they arrive on the field, and they're supposed to be there at least 30 to 45 minutes ahead of time. Well, that's – no, you you answered exactly what my question was. I'd always wondered what that really, really meant. One other thing that you had mentioned earlier in our talk is about the mindset about of an official. I would assume that most officials – umpires, referees, whatever the position may be, they're a fan of sport. Well, with that means you have teams that you prefer over other teams. How is it in the training, and this may be too long of a question or answer, then we have time, but maybe you can just give us a highlight. How does a referee, an umpire, how do they take out the fandom in them to just be an arbiter of what they see for that contest? Hmm. That is a tough question uh, from a standpoint of answering it quickly. Um, I guess the short of it is that they they go into a contest. First of all, they uh, do not accept assignments or they're not given assignments where there's a potential conflict with a team, a family member playing or uh, local residents in there or they're a member of the booster club or something. So, any potential bias is taken out based on the, the way they're assigned. But now when they get there, uh, you know, Bernard, they're human like everybody else is. And yeah, you got a kid in high school in the football that, that 
goes up and makes a tremendous catch and comes down and sticks a toe in bounds before he falls out, you know, a, a Julio Jones type acrobatic a catch, then, you know, yeah, they're going to be wowed by it, but because of their training and you hit the nail on the head because of their training, they, they are so focused into what they're looking for. You can't sit there and become a fan because you got too much to look for, mm-hmm. you know, you, you know, put seven, people on the field to cover 22 players that uh, you got to stay focused because all 22 tend to mess with you if you let them. So, so, uh, so yeah, just simply because they stay focused, they, that, that keeps them from, from uh, developing the fandom you're talking about. And after, you know, I won't say the first year, but after a couple of years uh, of experience, then 99% of the time, the officials don't have to worry about that anymore because now they have established habitual practices. I, I, I'm sure. I, I'm, I have no doubt, Greg. Last last question before we get you out of here, and this is kind of to, to jog your memory bank a little bit. Maybe share with us some favorite games or situations that you've been involved with, maybe a favorite player or something that just really brings a smile to your face that you've either been a participant in the stands or you've been an officiant on the field or court. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to, not many people know this, Bernard, but I, I don't know how many follow your program, but they're all fixing to learn this. Um, you know, it's just too many for me to mention any one situation, sure. but I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you how I decided which games to go watch. All right. First of all, I had a reputation amongst all the officials. You never know where Greg Brewer is going to show up. Mm-hmm. And that's true. They didn't because they never could figure out where I was going to go. And uh, your brother is an example of this back when uh, all three of you, your brothers, when y'all went to, to Northview, um, I would always, uh, I was, I was a boy state counselor for about 12 years. And I had the privilege of meeting a lot of young folks, um, juniors in high school over those 12 years. And so those, that was the time frame when I started the job in Montgomery. So, you know, I told them in the summer that I would try to come watch them play one game if I could, whatever sport it was. And so um, what I would do is I would go down the list and I would see where my boy staters were playing on Friday nights in football or Tuesdays and Fridays for basketball or baseball. And I would say, okay, I'm going to go to Excel, Alabama, because I got a kid that lives in my boy state city. And those officials have no idea that Greg Brewer from Montgomery is going to drive to Excel just to watch that little team play. But, 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 but I did because I, I did that to support the guy, the, the, the kids. Mm-hmm. But now I'm going to tell you one other thing too. Uh, and this is not to, it's not a, a big negative necessarily against the upper division schools, the 6A, 7As, but I love going out to the communities where football was appreciated uh, more so than big metro areas. Uh, there are exceptions to that. Not every metro area uh, has good following for their schools. But then there are some in the metro areas, uh, some in the, as you know, in the uh, uh, over the mountain crowd in Birmingham, that, that in the Jefferson County area that follows there. So Dalton's pretty good, and, you know, Mobile. So, I mean, but but I always enjoy. I would rather go watch a three A four A division game out in rural county Alabama. A lot of times, rather than sitting, I could have stayed at home in Montgomery and gone to Crampton Bowl and watched good football any night I wanted to. But when when you go to Crampton Bowl and they have 200 people there, uh, which is sad, um, but there are versus going down to Thomasville, Alabama, for example, uh, where they got 3,000 people sitting in the stands, uh, when, you know, when they're playing Grove Hill or, or Clark County, their rival. Um, that basically tells me um, or or helps remind me of what we're in the business for because that's where you see the the true community spirit behind high school athletics and everything that's involved in it. 
you know, it's it's you, you, you've probably seen this, Greg, in those small towns, particularly when it's playoff season, there'll be signs in the window of the businesses gone to the stadium <laughs> or last one out, turn out the lights or something like that. But yeah, uh, Greg, I, as, as officials, we always joke if we're going to rob a town, we're going to go to the big rivals. Uh, <laughs> that's when, right. when, when uh, you know, Lion Bull and, and uh, in uh, the county over there, uh, I can't think of the name of the uh, county, but anyway, when they played each other, uh, anyway, it's just, just a lot of fun. Well, that's uh, the last thing I'll share is I can remember when we played Opelika uh, in the playoffs my senior year. And I remember driving through the heart of the business district, go to the stadium. Every one of those businesses had signs supporting Opelika's high school program. And then you would see those signs go on to the stadium. And I just, I love that about small town uh, high school sports. But Greg, thank you for sharing with us your experiences and, and your, your wisdom of what you've been so proud of to help build over the last 30 plus years. So thank you very much today. Well, Bernard, I enjoyed being here. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, as you can tell, officiating has been a passion of mine my whole life. The good Lord put me in a position to uh, attempt to do something about it, but I'll say it again, like I said when it first started, it, it uh, took the team concept. I may have been the catalyst that got things started, but if the officials and the coaches didn't buy into it, it would have gone nowhere. So uh, I'm just thankful for the for the opportunity to, to have been um, in and around sports and uh, look forward to watching somebody else move things forward. Guys, Greg Brewer, calling it like he sees it. So thank you again. As I, I said, I say it every every week. That's why I keep doing this show. Interesting conversations with people in their areas of expertise, and there's none finer than Greg Brewer. So thank you, Greg. Thank you, audience. And as we always do, every Tuesday, 10 a.m. Central, 8 a.m. Pacific, Nomberg Law Live. And we're going to keep doing these as long as you guys keep showing up. Y'all have a good rest of your week. Take care.